Good evening. This is Mae Bressel. The title of this program is World Watchers. It's program number 738, January the 27th, 1986. All through the years, those months go so fast, I just get in a state of shock when I see, oh boy, it's the end of one month. Eleven more to go in the end of the year. It goes so fast these days. I wonder if it does. I'm sure it does for you the way it does around here. There's going to be a four-day conference in Monterey, California. A listener to World Watcher sent me this brochure. It's going to be at the Hyatt Regency in Monterey, a four-day financial. It's called a financial conference. Of course, it's a Cold War propaganda activity put on by an institution by Bill Kennedy, president of the Western Monetary Consultants Incorporated, and it's for advice and investment and intelligence briefing, $100 for the four days to attend it. The chairman is Bill Kennedy. He's president of Western Monetary Consultants. He's co-author of a taxpayer survey of the Grace Commission report, and he is the chairman of this particular event and the institution, Western Monetary Consultants. A woman who is going to participate in the conference that's of particular interest is Kathy McDonald, described in the brochure that was sent to me or the pamphlet, the widow of the late Congressman Larry McDonald, Mrs. McDonald worked closely with her husband for many years and is continuing his international efforts to oppose the financing of communism. Mrs. McDonald will discuss the principles that Larry McDonald defended until his murder at the hands of the communists. The principles of putting a $100,000 computer as chairman of Western Goals and the head of the Birch Society into the police department's specifically the Los Angeles, and they're probably in every major police department in the city, putting the names of people who committed no crime but attended events that uh, it was a right to participate in and then by their, therefore became an enemy of the state. Howard Phillips, chairman of the Conservative Caucus, will be here, uh, part of a grassroots lobbying organization. It's a, based in Vienna, Georgia. Every time I hear or see the Vienna, I think of Elaine Von Damme. It's like Jerry Falwell being at Lynchburg, Virginia, and I think of the Klan in Vienna suits Mr. Howard Phillips properly. Another speaker is Major General George J. Keegan, Jr., the world's most knowledgeable authority on strategic affairs and the Soviet Union. He resigned as chief of the U.S. Air Force Intelligence in 1977 to alert Americans about Soviet military threat. He takes the um, circuit, he does a lot of lecturing, and he's on a lot of these organizations, and they'll tell you about coming terrorism in America, no place to hide, and that's why Larry McDonald and these various people involved, even in with this organization, uh, J. Peter Grace's friend, Mr. Milliken, his partner, helped set up Western Goals and John Reese with the funds for the front organization for the military anyway. And those computers will have the list of people who would be rounded up in case there were problems in this country. And, of course, with um, John Singlob's Robert Brown and the Soldiers of Fortune and so forth, they will be coming through the towns and cities and containing the terrorism, the leftist terrorism, using the data banks of Western goals. So they're going to tell you there's no place to hide, and that's true. There's no place to hide from these people when it all comes down. The communists aren't going to knock on our door and take us away. It's going to be these people that are going to take us away, and now they're going to discuss terrorism in America. I usually go down to L.A. that week. Uh, I don't think I'll be able to visit that conference. It's $100. It's pretty expensive, but that's the week in March, my mother's birthday, so I don't think I'll be able to attend. If you want to come to Monterey and uh, hear these people and see them, you can, and the location will be the Hyatt Regency in Monterey. I want to just discuss a few things about Martin Luther King because I left off last week and, and wanted to call attention to a few articles uh, and a few items before we go on to other material. There's one in the San Francisco Chronicle, January 21st, Unkept Promise at King Death Site, and it's about the Lorraine Motel that was bought in 1982. They were going to tear it down. That's where Martin Luther King was murdered, and they, it was bought for $144,000, and they called it the Lorraine Civil Rights Museum, 
and they're trying to raise money to make it into an educational center and a museum for people in Memphis, Tennessee, and they haven't been able to do it. So in the meantime, they're using it. It's being used as a horror house, and the ladies of the night or the day, whichever way you want, stream in and out, and there's just no way to maintain this place. It's all run down and pretty much of a disgrace. The article says, in room 306, where King was staying on April 4th, 1968 has been turned into a glass-enclosed shrine. The space is shared with memorabilia from Lorraine Bailey, the motel manager, who suffered a cerebral hemorrhage after learning of King's death and died of a heart attack the next day. Martin Luther King was supposed to stay at another hotel. I forget whether it was the Howard Johnson or the Sheridan, one of them, a more well-known, of course, white hotel where many of the whites stayed, And then he was told and directed uh, to go to the Lorraine Motel because he was going to lead some strikes there in Memphis, Tennessee, and he better be where the black people are so that he appears to be one of them. He was one of them, definitely, but they wanted to stay at this hotel. And it was the whoever coaxed him to stay at that hotel uh, was setting him up, in fact, for what happened later because that's where the arrangement was to have him murdered from uh, that location. And uh, the woman who was in charge of changing the arrangements was dead. Of course, I mentioned last week, Martin Luther King's brother was found drowning. He was uh, in a pool dead. Shortly afterwards, his mother was murdered at the church, sitting at the organ, playing at the organ. Two judges that handled the case both died. Uh, Percy Foreman, his CIA attorney, died. And uh, his brother also was... uh, one of those that was helping make the change of arrangements, who was at the Lorraine Motel, as well as Jesse Jackson and Andrew Young. Uh, They go on to say that it's a shame they don't have the money to do it. It's a shame that on the other side of town, you have the Graceland Mansion for Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll. On this town, you have this hole in the wall for the king of civil rights, where prostitutes leave the motel after daybreak, and the clientele of men and pickup trucks and Cadillacs are replaced by station wagons and families, and then the evening it's just filled again with the women and the cars pulling up. And they made the comparison of Graceland across the street, one king, and then the shabby, terrible, disheveled place of the other king, leaving that kind of memory. And it's hard to think when you saw all the money spent and the celebrations and the bronze statue and all the things that went on that... People wouldn't have consideration to put a fund into that particular hotel. There's another article in LA Times that about a speech of Jesse Jackson. Last week I made a mistake, and I don't make too many of them, but I had, in fact, very seldom uh, do I see something that retracts my original uh, uh, feelings about this matter. I hadn't read, among all the articles, and maybe it was too soon, obviously it was, the statements of Jesse Jackson and a few others regarding the murder of Martin Luther King. The L.A. Times had a story. January 21st, uh, they tell about George Bush getting a thunderous ovation from people at the audience when he went down to um, uh, Atlanta, Georgia, for the celebration. I keep calling it a celebration. The birthday, I guess it was a celebration for a lot of people. It was to remember his birthday, and I think that George Bush, the former director of the CIA, a very wealthy man, a millionaire himself, can come down and give a speech. And then, of course, there is that shabby hotel that everyone ignores. Bush was there getting a standing ovation, and uh, some remained unconvinced of his sincerity, it says. But then there was another description of a speech of Jesse Jackson, also on the uh, CBS Morning Show. Early in the day, the Reverend Jesse Jackson charged, the jury is not in yet on whether the government was behind King's assassination. Appearing on CBS Morning News, Jackson said, this was in New Orleans, we know he was character assassinated by our government. As to whether or not he was physically assaulted by them, the question is still out. I mean, the jury is not yet in on that. In Washington, FBI duty officer Jeff Maynard and Justice Department spokesman Terry Eastland said they had no comment on Jackson's remarks. James Earl Ray is serving a 99-year sentence after he pleaded guilty. And the Los Angeles Herald had a story January the 20th. 
convicted killer James Earl Ray insists he was only a pawn. Ray says that the government officials, including Percy Foreman, the late Percy Foreman, who was a CIA attorney, forced him to plead guilty. Ray claimed he was the pawn in a conspiracy to kill King. He was framed by a man known as Raoul. Of course, he had Bernard Fensterwald, another CIA attorney, uh, on his side. Ha <laughs> ha. You see what good it did. And Mr. Haynes, another CIA attorney, and of course, Mark Lane, the four of them. And it doesn't look like Ray will get out with those uh, people around him. I doubt if he ever will get out. He says that he wanted to write a book on this subject, and he's calling it The Rule of Law, They Say. That's the title of the book. He wants a publisher because uh, he can't get this out in a court of law, and he wants a foreign publisher because no American publisher would treat him fairly. There are many people who write books, such as, uh, well, we think of Morgan, Vicki Morgan, who got her head cracked open with a baseball bat. I could cite endless people who think, now I have a book, I can tell a story. The minute the book comes out, they're dead. That is the end of them. Uh, Mr. Butcher, the, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, the man who did the investigative work on the uh, Korea Gate story, uh, did a book on Reverend Moon and that organization. And it wasn't too long afterwards before people even really knew about the book that he went flying out of a window in New York City and was dead. It's a very hard way to tell the world. The world doesn't care to know, or they could go and open up the committee again. And, of course, he's in a very dangerous position being in jail and James Ray thinks, or maybe he's being coaxed, you know, to write a book, and then that uh, will be the excuse for somebody to come in, and he certainly isn't going to get this story out. The article said, after a three-year investigation, the Congress, this is the Congressional Select Committee on Assassinations, concluded in 1979 that Ray killed Martin Luther King, but they said there was substantial evidence to establish the existence of a St. Louis conspiracy and that did, in fact, finance the assassination. The congressional panel criticized the Justice Department and the FBI for spying on Martin Luther King and for failing to investigate the possibility of a conspiracy for his murder. Even though Ray admitted that he bought the gun and rented the room, the gun was part of a gun-running scheme and went to Raoul, and Ray was several blocks away when Martin Luther King was killed. And then for those of you that don't remember, he went on to Canada and to Portugal and uh, to London, Canada to London, to Portugal, back to London, and was arrested on his way down to Africa. Another story in the Los Angeles Herald, they did quite a good amount of uh, work on this. They, there was a uh, news conference, they reported, before a lot of people were there giving speeches before the main event, the Saturday evening and the Sunday uh, finalizing the Martin Luther King birthdays. Political leaders got together in California, including the State Assembly Speaker Willie Brown, Congressman Mervyn Dimely, and Assemblyman Maxine Waters. And Dr. King was assassinated, said, Dr., said Jesse Jackson, and they quoted him with another quote in the same article, uh, saying the government was implicated. He said, FBI memos said that their role was to disrupt, discredit, destroy, the black leader. It was to stop the black messiah. It was the role of Dr. King, who became a national security threat because of his charisma. And they referred to him as messiah. And as I say, Jesse Jackson and Andrew Young could stay in line. They were the ones that were supposed to be the heirs to the messiah of Martin Luther King. King couldn't be compromised the way the other men are compromised. And I doubt that he would travel around with people like Louis Farrakhan, who are meeting with Mr. Metzger of the Nazi Party and the Klan. This same article in the Herald said James Earl Ray possessed neither the IQ nor the acumen to kill King and to get out of the country. The government had to be helping him with these various roles and in covering up. And I mentioned this last week, this thing about Merv Dimely. December the 17th, 1986, the end of the year, there was a story, Korean Rally Welcomes Reverend Moon. This is the Reverend Moon, uh, funded by Rio Shisasakawa, who was the guest of honor of Mrs. King, the Reverend Moon of Causa, the death squads in South America, Central America, Nicaragua, Guatemala, where the killing is still going on, even though there's a new president, and El Salvador supporting the police establishment there. 
and funds millions and millions of dollars in South America trying to put back the dictatorship, the Nazi, really, literally Nazi dictatorship in Argentina and to overthrow Brazil again and to fund dictators, right-wing people in Bolivia and uh, Paraguay, Uruguay, and so forth. That's Mr. Ryosha Sasakawa with Reverend Moon. And when Reverend Moon went back to Korea and got out of jail for his financial dealings, which were very minor compared to what he really is in, he went back to Korea and he was accompanied by Representative Merv Dimely of California. The Reuters article said, speaking at the rally in South Korea where there were 25,000 people, an anti-communist rally was Representative Merv Dimely, California Democrat, who thanked Reverend Moon for his efforts to bring freedom to Korea. There is no greater strength to fight communism than one belief in the power of the Christian church. That's Merv Dimely, the uh, black representative in California who also was very thick with Jim Jones, who was running a mind control experiment station and, and you know, the rest of that business down in Jonestown. Merv Dimely traveling with Reverend Moon, praising the Christian control of democracy in South Korea. And South Korea is a place where if you're a student and get protesting uh, on your mind, you get your head cracked with a baseball bat. That's a whole country of uh, Marvin Pankos who just crash people's heads open. There is very little freedom in the Christian country that he's talking about and certainly no elections and no chance to speak out in South Korea. But it's a good Christian country for Merv Dimely, for Reverend Moon, for, Ryo for Ryosha Sasakawa and his Japanese mafia connections, gun running, and so forth. And then these people participated in remembering Martin Luther King as if they could be identified and of the same ilk as King if they helped in this celebration. One of the most disgusting articles of this whole event was January the 12th in the Washington Post. Uh, it was written by Kathy Sawyer. Atlanta commemoration limited by a tight budget, but enthusiasm was plentiful in the Grand Parade. There was a budget projection of $1.5 million for the Martin Luther King holiday in Atlanta and so forth, but they had to make do with 400000 including 300000 raised from private sources. Maybe that's Riosha Sasakawa also. And the parade in Atlanta, Georgia, was put together by some very interesting, I well, I say interesting, tongue-in-cheek. The article says the organizers of the amalgam that in, includes conservative Republicans and corporate chiefs, as well as civil rights veterans, seemed determined to make up in enthusiasm what they lacked in money. Everyone rallied for the day, and actually, why did they have to put any money, a large amount, into it? They could have fixed up the Lorraine Motel and used the money for better ways. I believe they should have. They don't ever call me on those matters. Now, regarding the parade in Atlanta, Colonel Jack T. Downey, Third Army Chief of War Plans, one of the many federal officials and staff on loan to the King Holiday Commission. He directs the Atlanta office. Wouldn't Martin Luther King be killed by a group with war plans? Of course he was. The Permindex operation, the team that set him up, was a defense department, just as it was John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and Martin Luther King. But here is a man who followed Mahatma Gandhi's beliefs, believed in nonviolence, and to commemorate his birthday, they had the Third Army Chief of War Plans uh, leading the parade and heading the parade. Then the article goes on, Among the varied VIP expected in the next week are Senator Ted Edward Kennedy and Secretary of Education William J. Bennett. That is so obscene. All you have to do is... Think of what Bennett says about the blacks, about the black children in schools, his racism, his coaxing people into Christian, white Christian colleges and getting tax benefits for the private schools so they don't have to go to school with blacks. He would set the blacks back a 100 years, and he was part of the celebration to be, it was ready to take place. Edward Kennedy voted for the Graham Rudman bill. Wait and see how that affects particularly the blacks in the next years as many of the opportunities and advantages they have are cut by Reagan wanting to fund Star Wars at all costs and dropping the budget and this man, the Senator Kennedy, 
and Senator Dole, also who was down there, voted for the Graham-Rudman bill. Uh, they mentioned uh, Senator Dole going down there, and B- Bishop Desmond Tutu, and Vice President Bush. Now, for the corporations, the McDonald Corporation helped produce a film called Happy Birthday, Dr. King, and the American Can Company provided a video. The McDonald's were the company that coaxed the low wages, the minimum wage be dropped, probably, I think it was down around $2 an hour, particularly for students, college students, going working in the summer, and McDonald's hamburgers make their millions and millions out of employing black minorities and so forth and coaxing the very bottom wage that they can get the hardest work per hour. Not the hardest, but it, it's not easy work. It's continuous, but the wages, uh, they were the ones who were coaxing, among a few others, for giving these very, very low wages and reaping in prices, the same kind of prices, and students who work in the summer to go to school are at a disadvantage. They could hardly work or save anything for that. They mentioned Albert Davis, a vice president of the land based Coca-Cola company, who took time off from work with the King Center on the celebration and was helping out with some of the work, and he said at least some of the problem was political. Some people, he said, had decided that it was politically unwise to give this major support, but he went ahead. Now, Coca-Cola uh, was named in a magazine, National Reporter, as being a conduit of funds for Permindex, for Larry McDonald. Permindex is the operation that was set up after World War II, uh, right immediately after it's to rebuild the German uh, rearmament to get that off the ground again, and Permindex was the branch formed for the assassination teams that was part of the plan and did kill John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and Martin Luther King, and Coca-Cola was identified in Atlanta, Georgia, as part of the Permadex operation. And remember Robert Byron Watson. I wrote about him in my article. In Rebel of uh, November 83, on the anniversary of the murder of John Kennedy, and it was about Permadex, and it was Marvin Watson's uh, testimony before the House Select Committee, he worked in a gallery where these men were talking about in the next day, next week, rather, they were going to kill Martin Luther King, and they did, in fact, kill him. And they were linked uh, directly to the Permandex operation. So much for the social gathering. They said uh, if the, the enthusiasm was great, the budget was tight, and all of those people mentioned could have swung the budget even a little better. Now, the Andrew Young was very much a part of the celebration. Of course, you saw him or the remembrance of the birthdays. And I just want to cite one little article from the Sunday Star Bulletin from Honolulu, September 22nd. Uh, It's about South Africa, South African citizenship, a parathroid, and how South Africa could learn from the American South and uh, from the Protestant region in which the integration began, thanks to Martin Luther King. And the article says the initiatives of the South African businessman To get together with men from America can be viewed as a hopeful sign in the difficult change ahead of negotiating non-destructive resolution to difficult and complex problems. The critical link between Birmingham and Atlanta is the city's uh, present mayor, Andrew Young, of Atlanta, Georgia, the former U.N. ambassador for Jimmy Carter, who is familiar with the complexities of African politics and economic problems. In 1963, in Birmingham, as a top lieutenant to Dr. Martin Luther King, Young marched in his dungarees in the morning. Then in the evening, he changed to his business suit and met with white business leaders in the afternoon. There he joined Burke Marshall, head of the Civil Rights Division of the Kennedy Justice Department, now a professor of law at Yale University. Marshall won the confidence and respect of the business elite in Birmingham, Alabama, where he spent weeks sitting up and participating in negotiations of a local newspaper publisher who asked that he come to the city. An invitation from South African business elite to Andrew Young and Burke Marshall to share their experiences could prove helpful. It certainly couldn't make matters worse. Now, Burke Marshall is the attorney uh, who was brought in by Jacqueline uh, Kennedy Onassis to, uh, even before she was an uh, Onassis, to keep the lid on all investigations in the archives on the murder of John Kennedy he was to hold the key that nobody could get certain papers in any of our lifetimes on the, who killed John Kennedy. That's Burke Marshall. And after Chappaquiddick and Mary Jo Kopechny was killed, 
Brown there, and Ted Kennedy got to a telephone. He called Burt Marshall immediately. So Burt Marshall holds the family secrets on the murder of John Kennedy, and along with Andrew Young and, of course, Jesse Jackson, they know the house secrets, I suppose, on who killed Martin Luther King. And while they become very prominent and wealthy and conspicuous in all the various sources of media that we have today, they hold the story down on the real truth so that we can find out who did these murders and realize that those people in power today had a part, if not the planning of the murder, at least we know they had a part in covering it up. Now, there's one item that I've been seeing in the news for the past month or two months that I've put off discussing with you just for fear I might puke on the air, but I've never done that. But I guess I have to let it out now or I'll burst because I can't fathom anything so horrendous as this. The article is Henry Kissinger wants to run for Senate. This was out of the San Francisco Chronicle January 24th, but I have earlier stories. Former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger rushed from France to New York by way of the Concord last night to attend an annual conservative party. Rumors are flying that Kissinger is considering the 1988 run for Senate against Senator Patrick Monahan. Now, the next step from there in running for Senate is to change the Constitution that a foreign-born can become President of the United States and Henry Kissinger will be the President of the United States someday. I think that this was decided years and years ago just as I was saying, 10 years before uh, Ronald Reagan was sworn in his office that he would be president, and I was told over and over again it was impossible that somebody so incompetent and so horrendous could actually be voted president of the United States, and a lot of people assume that other people catch on, but they don't catch on. So Henry Kissinger is part, of course, he's the very conservative group. Phyllis Schlafly wrote a book about him years ago, and the cover was a you know, he was a Boris, a Jewish spy, a Russian spy, you know, uh, all of these stories combined together, a communist and a Jew, you know, make a perfect enemy as he works his way up into the establishment and secures himself in the establishment, which he has always done. He's a murderer, a mass murderer, a drug dealer. He is one of the most detestable people because of that smile and because people rationalize that charm. I never could see it, but watch out. He'll get the Senate seat if Henry wants it. And just one last item um, before I go on to, I want to discuss the hearing, the advanced genetic scientist that I worked on last week and went to eight hours of hearings in Monterey this week, actually today. Uh, the one last article in the San Francisco Chronicle I want to share. Neo-Nazis forfeit cash and arsenal. Now, 22 Nazis were charged with racketeering and were arrested up in Seattle. I've mentioned that before. One of them is on the lam. He hasn't been arrested. That leaves 21, and 10 went to trial. So you get a good round figure of 11 that are still out. So the 10 that were convicted, 10 members of the violent Nazi group convicted of racketeering, have agreed to forfeit $400,000 in cash thousands more in property and weaponry, enough for a small army. They have forfeited this because they've been convicted of the racketeering charges. Then the article goes on, however, the bulk of the more than $4 million that members of the order were accused of taking in bank and armored car, ro car robberies have never been found. They were not only accused of it, but they were convicted of these charges of the bank robbery, and so forth. The U.S. attorney, Susan Barnes, said that the forfeited material would be auctioned off unless it is of use to the government agencies. The guns will be destroyed. Well, you can buy guns like you can buy chickens at a ranch or, or eggs at a ranch. This is so ridiculous. So after the, they were convicted on December 30th, one of them, Bruce Pierce of the Order, said that he would give up his homes in Roseville, Georgia, 30000 in cash, a 40-foot mobile home, 969 grenades, dynamite, a machine gun, seven pistols, and it lists his belongings, a crossbow, a metal tomahawk, and they would give up a CB radio, two-way radio. Gary Yarbrough would give up 35000 in cash, a motorcycle, and vehicles. Now, why did it, it names a few of them and what they had to give up? Why? I don't understand why they just didn't say uh, stay in jail forever, go to the clink or tell us where the $4 million went, who got it, 
and then take it back from those people and arrest them for receiving stolen property, which they know uh, is a law. They could abide by that law, handing it out to other factions of Nazi and Klan and Posse around the country. I really don't understand uh, how this works, but the U.S. Attorney's Office obviously uh, works in collusion with these organizations whereby they pick up a few belongings and let the organization keep its cash. We'll take a one-minute break now, and then I'm going on to the matter of the hearing at the Board of Supervisors today, the meeting on uh, the genetic mutation of bacteria for spreading agriculturally in the Salinas Valley in Monterey County. This is May Brussel, and this is side two of tape number 738 of World Watchers. Last week, I was telling you about the hearing that was to take place uh, at the Board of Supervisors and about the plans to spray the mo part of Monterey County, just a small area, granted, a little area with a genetically altered material. And they had eight hours, nine hours of hearings, and I want to share with you some material that I did this past week. Thanks to another World Watcher who went to the library right away and did the early legwork, and then I went back to the library and followed up with a lot of this, and a lot of us went to the hearing and participated in that. Uh, in the Monterey Herald, among other quotations regarding the experiments that were to, to take place, I cited on the air last week a quotation from one of the people involved in this, a Mr. Stephen Cull, C-U-L-L, -L, an employee of AGS, uh, responding to criticism that one of the bacteria strains can cause infection in diseased human, weakened humans, Mr. Call acknowledged that some strains of Pseudomonas fluorescens have been causing low-grain infections in people who have impaired immune systems. He said the strain to be used in the field experiments cannot grow in the temperature of the human body, but then later it came out that it can grow at the temperature of the human body, it was brought out uh, last uh, in the last part of the session, probably around 4 or 5 o'clock, that yes, in fact, it can grow in the human body. Well, the way that this thing happened, it came down so fast, uh, a decision to spray, for the first time in the world, a section of Monterey County, one of the richest agricultural areas in the United States or in the world, they reminded us yesterday, and I forgot, I knew that this was the salad bowl of the world. It supplies 90 to 95 percent of the lettuce of the world. It supplies 80 percent of the cauliflower, about 80 percent of the artichokes, and where a, there's large garlic and green onions also, but those grow, not the, the onions do other places, but not the garlic. It is a tremendous agricultural area. And you, even though you test a site that is two acres closed off and less than an acre where the actual test site is going to be on strawberries, oh, yeah, it supplies about 60 or 70 percent of strawberries of the world also. Uh, they don't go to this length to put millions of dollars and 11 years of work into testing a, a small half acre or so of spraying strawberries with live genetic bacteria to keep it at that length. It's to put on larger farms and larger areas and to spread. So a very controlled test in where an area means tomorrow the world. It's like you can make one LSD to see the effect on the brain, which Sandoz Lab and IG Farben did and Alan Dulles distributed as part of the CIA work. But when he bought 43 million LSD, that was a different story. And we're still paying the price in this country with the zombies walking around who've been psychically injured by being given this poison made out of IG Farben's laboratory with the help of our intelligence director who set up with OSS the IG Farben connections during and after the war and probably long before also. So anyway, uh, this hearing took place regarding these matters and he, this one as I say, very attentive person went quickly to the library and looked in the current standard and poor uh, I have one of the earlier books, but this is the 1984-85, and they looked up Advanced Genetic Scientist, Sciences Incorporated, and it was important to do that because my gut feeling about the way the operation came down was, and I said last week, that the group in the California area testing, AGS, 
has to be a dummy front for a larger operation that it is the equivalent of the Mullen office at the time of Watergate that really represented the White House and the Central Intelligence Agency, that it was the little link that would do the testing if anything went wrong, but it had to have connection somebody, somewhere else because you simply don't plunk your way down right into the heart of this rich, rich area and one of the wealthiest communities of Pebble Beach over the, the other side of the valley and this very prestigious area and put this live genetic bacteria there unless somebody has given orders and approval to do so and the, the Board of Supervisors read in the newspaper it was taking place and the health officers were told they wouldn't be able to know where it was taking place. So therefore, it was necessary to go to Standard & Poor and look them up. Advanced Genetic, Re uh, Advanced Genetic Sciences Incorporated has an address in Greenwich, Connecticut. They didn't list the Berkeley address, even though they had a Berkeley laboratory and all of the overt work that you see that's recognizable comes from offices in uh, Berkeley in Oakland, California, not in Berkeley. They're right next to each other. So Oakland, California is the uh, home base of the Western Division, but for all purposes, the offices are in Connecticut, in Greenwich, Connecticut. Their attorney is on Lexington Boulevard in New York City. The main office is in Connecticut, but all of the work and the presentation of the people putting on their defense of wanting to do this comes out of Oakland, California. As a matter of fact, they had a two-page sheet. I wish I could copy it for all of you, uh, a handout for people at, at the hearings, and it's titled, of course, Advanced Genetic Sciences Incorporated Sciences Fact Sheet Release of Ice Minus Bacteria Correcting the Fallacies. And there's no letterhead, there's no address, no doctors, no biologists, no PhDs to identify it with anybody, not a phone number or anything. Just eight statements on the sheet that looked like they came out of the sixth grade uh, meetings of a grammar school report. It, very childish and simplistic, and the people they chose were just about the same. They'd be the spokesman for them. Now, Standard & Poor's list their officers. Uh, their chief financial officer, Mr. Thompson, the secretary, the accounts and in New York City, Arthur Anderson is the accountant, and so forth in their product, science products, agriculture, and industry, and they listed five directors. Now, I'm going to discuss two of the directors of advanced sciences, advanced uh, genetic sciences with you, and more if I have time. The two are Lawrence Bogorod, and the other is R. E. Naylor. Now, in addition to that, this other uh, person who was seeking material went quickly to an article that was in the New York Times. It came out in 1984, and I might have cited it last week by Judge, it was about Judge John Sirica turning down the application for this particular experiment a while back, and he found it looking under the index of this advanced genetic sciences. It was listed in the New York Times index, and he located this interesting article that I just cited, May the 30th, 1984, in case you want to locate it yourself, page 5D. Advanced Genetic Chief Sounds Optimistic Note. Thomas Dryot, D, no, there's not an R, Dyot, D-Y-O-T-T, has already been offered a job as President and Chief Operating Officer of Advanced Genetic Scientists. This is May 30th, 1984. He was offered this job. It, it said, when one of the company's major projects involving the first outdoor testing of genetically altered organisms was ordered halted by federal judge, district judge John J. Sirica two weeks ago, Mr. Dio, who is 36, took the job anyway. The federal judge said this is halted. But Dio wasn't worried, as the, as the article says. He, I'm going to take it anyway. I'm coming to California anyway. I don't consider the decision a significant setback, he said in his interview um, as he was appointed president of the company with their headquarters in Greenwich, Connecticut, and this turned us on to that avenue. It's pretty widely accepted that genetic engineering will eventually be a major factor in agriculture. People differ on what sort of time frame will be involved. We're going to do it, but you just, when is you may stall us, but it's the time frame. The fact is it's going to happen. Mr. Diode 
former manager of exploratory agriculture products and research at Rome and Haas, R-O-H-M and H-A-A-S Company, owns 15% of advanced genetic sciences, sciences, will officially assume office in the company's research facility in Berkeley, California, June the 1st. The offices of the company are in Oakland. The research testing is in Berkeley. Judge Sirica's decision in the form of a temporary restraining order stopped the proposed outdoor test in California by a Berkeley scientist, Stephen Lindau, who was there today testifying, of a genetically altered bacteria that inhibits frost from forming on potato plants. Now, that was 1984 in May, and it was potato plants. It became strawberry plants in November of 85, and in the interim, Judge John J. Sirica had conveniently died, and when they made the application for the test this time, it went through so quickly that the subject was brought up at the hearings. How could you apply for a test at a federal level and have it passed within a month when it takes about nine months at the state level for approval of Environmental Protection Agency, the National Institute of Health, and you got in one month, and at the federal level it takes maybe a year or more to get an approval. They got it in a month. It went right through this time. As I say, the judge was dead. Uh, Mr. Dio wasn't there. I don't know if he's still with the company. And the crop now is uh, strawberries. Then it was potatoes. And at the hearing, they said it was for fruit, such as pears and apricots and peaches, which have nothing to do, of course, with spraying strawberries. Uh, but they decided on this area. And I think that's the main thing. And the bulk of in 90, 100 percent of the people doing this work are Mexicans brought in from Mexico. Uh, we bring them in and allow them to work and uh, under some terrible conditions, I might add. And I believe still that this is an experiment and it was determined we'll do it here and nowhere else, not on the farmers, the white farmers up in Idaho or other places where there's a lot of frost because this is the bulk and assured Mexican farmers that come in to do the work. The New York Times article continues um, beyond the potato farmers. It says, "This, this may delay us a year or more, postponing any profits that advanced genetic science might earn. Science, I keep calling it scientists on the commercial rights to the products developed through the project which the company sponsored. Mr. Diote, a Rochester native who received his Ph.D. in chemistry from Princeton University, said that while there is a delay in testing, it would slow down the company's development plans. They still would explore genetic engineering, and they're going through with a project, a bacteria that would help form ice, another ice project, Uh, making artificial snow for ski resorts and so forth, so that this company has been doing that project. And it reminds me of the snowmobile and John DeLorean. But they didn't mind hiring a man with a Ph.D. in chemistry from Princeton University employed by Rome and Haas, Rome and Haas having 15% interest in the company out in California because even though the judge turned it down, uh, pretty soon it would go through. As I say, the judge is dead, just coincidentally, of course. Ha, ha, ha. You know how my mind works. And then they sneak this into Monterey County. Now, if you look up Standard & Poor's under Roman Haas, you get a different view of advanced genetic science because that's one of the largest major corporations in the United States, maybe in the world. Standard & Poor's has a section Roman Haas, and they list their assets as a billion plus, billion and a half, and their net worth into like 900 million and so forth, their liabilities, 667 million. And then they list the officers on the board of directors, and I looked up in who's who, the various ones. I'm going to share some of those with you next week because 15% of that whole comp they own 15% of the company out west, and then it lists their subsidiaries that are all over the United States, and their worldwide subsidiaries international. Uh, there's the Electro Materials in Mamaroneck Mar- 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 at New York, Fulane Products in San Fernando Road in Los Angeles, Isochem Products in Lincoln, Rhode Island, the Pitar and Company, Wilmington, Delaware, Roman Haas Advanced Materials, the Philadelphia. They have. About six main offices in Philadelphia, LaPorte, Texas, 
Roman Haas, California, and Hayward, California. That's right up your way on Whitesall Street. Roman Haas, Connecticut, Kensington, Connecticut, Wilmington, Delaware, and other in Bristol, Pennsylvania. Their international sales out of Wilmington, Delaware, Kentucky, and I could go on. Huge offices, Philadelphia, Knoxville, Tennessee, Deer Park, Texas, Woburn, Massachusetts, St. Mary, Florida. They pretty well cover the map, and the international could be every uh, place on the globe that you want to say they do their dealing in chemistry work. Now, in the Standard & Poor's, uh, the advanced genetic science is illicit science in Standard & Poor and in Million Dollar Directory. They're in both of those. As I say, their location is Connecticut. Their attorney is in New York. The offices are in Oakland on San Pablo Street. But uh, the when you call them up in Oakland, they say their offices are not in Connecticut any longer. I don't know when they close shop. The director is D.D. Adams, listed in Standard & Poor as chairman, executive officer. He's not listed in the index of corporate directors. Volume 2 has the directors of the corporations, and those mentioned in the uh, brochure in the Standard & Poor section don't have the directors listed in the directors list. They are listed as a corporation with the directors in there, but in the index of Standard & Poor, the names are off. And when you study dummy fronts, and if you read the first article I ever wrote, Why Was Martha Mitchell Kidnapped? I go into the dummy front organizations that were a cover for this larger thing that came down at Watergate, and this, I believe, AGS, is a cover for a larger operation. Now, the board members in Standard & Poor that were listed under the corporation as I say, I want to discuss Lawrence Bogorod, director of AGS, and R.E. Naylor, who is the director of AGS. And when I looked up the directors in Who's Who, I found that Mr. Naylor uh, is also on the board of directors of Roman Haas. He is vice president. So not Roman Haas owns 15% of this company out here that's doing the genetic laboratory work. And one man in common... Mr. Naylor is on the board of both. He's the vice president of Roman Haas, the larger, larger corp corporation. In Who's Who in America, Robert Ernest Naylor Jr. is described, and I'm just going to run through this quickly. I think you'll get the idea without too much comment because I have a lot of material to cover. Bachelor of Science, University of California in Los Angeles, 1951. MA in Harvard, 1954. PhD at Harvard, 1956. He worked for DuPont Company in Wilmington, Delaware, under, in quotes, various positions in research and manufacturing. And you know DuPont is heavy into biological, chemical, and genetic type research. Uh, they are notorious for their supporting Adolf Hitler for their continuing processes along these lines of biological warfare. And he worked for them under that, quotes, various positions, which could be anything or traveling anywhere or checking on any experiments even the military experiments in um, Jonestown, where all the bodies were put in body bags and taken back to Delaware. He was director of research and planning at Corps for du uh, DuPont, 1956 to 76. He was technical director for Atomic Energy Division, 1979 to 1980. And I also heard stories, I think Mother Jones once published something about Joseph Mengele doing research, genetic experiments for the uh, Atomic Energy Division, this was down in Tennessee, he was vice president of Roman Haas in Philadelphia since 1981. He's still there, and then he's de described as director of AGS, Advanced Genetic Sciences. He's director of the Shipley Company in Newton, Massachusetts. When I looked that up in Standard & Poor's and in the other directories on corporations, Shipley isn't listed. I'll follow that for you next week. He's a Republican, and his offices are in Philadelphia, West Philadelphia, Independence Mall, Rome, and Haas. So Mr. Ernest, Robert Ernest Naylor, is uh, with his background at Harvard, DuPont, Atomic Energy, Roman Haas, is the bridge to over to AGS that it wants to open up this great exploratory process. Now, Lawrence Bogorod is another member of AGS, besides the fellow from Princeton that I cited before who... Uh, was going to join the company as a chemist uh, after it was turned down for approval by the federal government. That didn't stop him. Uh, now I want to go on to Mr. Bogorod, who is not on the board of Roman Haas, but he is on the board of AGS. And I looked up in Who's Who, 
uh, information of Lawrence Bogorat. Again, he's not in the index of stand of the Standard and Poor's directors. Um, neither of them are, although they index all the directors that they have cited in the corporations. They're not on the list of directors. Now, Lawrence Bogorod is on the board of JGS, and in one book, his wife Anne is on the directors also, but in another, in Who's Who, she isn't in the directors. Uh, she's listed as a director in the book Million Dollar Directory. She's part of AGS, and he's described as the following out of Who's Who. Biology educator, uh, which he was, born in Tashkent, Russia, 1921, came to the United States in 1922. He was a year old. I wonder if he traveled with Herbert Hoover's friends, if his parents were part of Vaslov's army, the Solidaris. I think of the white Russian czarist that left in 1922 uh, carrying a baby, of course. He wasn't responsible for those political changes, but he was born in Russia and came to the United States. He got his bachelor's degree in Chicago in 1942, Ph.D. in Botany, University of Chicago, uh, 1949. He instructed there 1948 to 51 he became assistant professor of the department 1953 to 1957 now those years 1951 to 1953 there's two years that are not accounted for i always uh, feel that some explanation should come and it did come those two years he worked for merck fellowship merck the chemical company that eventually uh he became one of the huge, large medical firms, one of the largest in the world, in America, M-E-R-C-K. He worked for them for two years, 1951 to 53. Then from work, he went to Harvard University, and there's a whole clique. Roman Haas is practically all Harvard, although we have the one Princeton guy uh, coming out to AGS. Professor 61 to 67, Cambridge Biology, uh, taught at Cambridge uh, in uh, Boston at Harvard U. In 1974 to 1976, he it was part of the Maria Moore's Cabot Foundation, the professor of biology. The Cabots, of course, part of the multi-Cabot link. You, you can think of Henry Cabot Lodge and Richard Nixon running as president, vice president against John Kennedy. Otto von Bolschring worked for the Cabot Company. That was his cover when he was part of the international Nazi Odessa network for Reinhard Galen and John Paul Getty and made him president of TCI in California, uh, the Cabots in the uh, that area in Boston, Massachusetts, and Cambridge were notorious for fronts and funding of this particular kind of operation and cover, particularly for Otto von Bolschwing and his international network of Nazis. He worked there under the Ca Maria Moore's Cabot professorship. It was titled in Boston, and then in 1976, he became a director of the Cabot Foundation in Cambridge, Massachusetts. In 1951 to 53, he was a visiting investigator for the Rockefeller Institute from 1951 to 53. While he was a visiting investigator for the Rockefeller Institute, he was working for the Merck Fellowship, and so he was going back and forth between the Rockefeller Medical Foundation the one that I cited two or three years ago for doing experimental work on cancer, locating the cancer virus way back in those days. Then he went on from 1978 to 82 to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Now I'm citing a member of the board of directors of a company that got an instant uh, approval for releasing the first genetically mutated bacteria, living bacteria, on agriculture in the Monterey County. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. He was part of the Joint Council on Agriculture and Food and Agriculture and Science Department from 1978 to 1982. And he wrote and edited various books through these years on plant physiology, applied molecular genetics. He served in the service from 1943 to 46 and was a Fulbright Scholar in 1960. Uh, that interim between uh, being Assistant Professor of Botany in Chicago and then going to Harvard, and his current office is the Department of Biology, Harvard University, 16 Divinity Avenue, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Now, you know, you don't really see Mr. Bogorod or Mr. Naylor's name in the news identified with his company out in California 
And I understand that uh, Rome and Haas had about four or five million into the company until 1984. And then there's no statistics of their pulling it out or putting it in. That's the privacy of the company, and we haven't seen that. It isn't available, or at least I haven't seen it. And I took the board of directors of Roman Haas, and I outlined the various characters in the colleges they came from, the ones that were in Who's Who. Those are the only ones we can know about. And I'm going to share some of those with you next week because they're very important. Now, currently in the news are many articles about genetics and science and the Environmental Protection Agency, the agency that gave the go-ahead on this with a, a known uncertainty. You can't prove an unknown, but there are these uncertainties, and there were appeals at the hearing from the public after the staff presentation gave their explanation of what they were going to do. Public officials spoke, public agencies spoke, and then the Foundation on Economic Trends, a representative for Jeremy Rifkin, from Washington was out here and gave probably the weakest presentation on why to stop it. And then from the audience, people were allowed to get up and they had to ask what question they were going to ask. And I uh, wanted to ask about Roman Haas and the relationship between a billion dollar chemical group that has obviously contracts for the Defense Department, for the intelligence community. We have a budget of 400 million that Ronald Reagan escalated in the past year for chemical and biological warfare. And then the expressed uh, uh, statement, the, these people said that it could be hazardous to some people who are sick or who have cancer, who live nearby. They asked, uh, this was supposed to be in an area that wasn't populated. That was one of the conditions of the spring. And they said, the report said there were two homes nearby and the Environmental Protection Agency chief came from Sacramento and just, it wasn't a testifying, he just spoke, it was not under oath or anything. He said he gave approval without even visiting or knowing where the site was. And they said, were you aware that there was a population of 30,000? And he wasn't aware of that at all. And they asked him, well, what about these people that this particular Pseudomonas fluorescence could damage and who have cancer? They said, well, they would be so far gone, they would pick that disease up in a hospital. They wouldn't even be home. It, to affect people, they'd have to be so sick that they wouldn't even be in their homes. You wouldn't be caring for them. It was, there was no scientific facts or data on any of this, but a lot of generalities. So I uh, got up and, and was allowed to speak, and Sam Karras is the main spokesman for the Board of Supervisors, the chairman. And I've known Sam Karras for 20 years, and have I well, when I get to newsletter and I'm not on the air, I can tell you about some of these people, for those of you that take a newsletter by tape. I can't put this on the air, but I can tell you individually and personally on the telephone what I've known about Sam Karras for the past 20 years. So uh, he began his, present, his opening up remarks by saying, we're not going to have any witch hunts today. Uh, we said hello when I came in, and he knew that what May Brussel does is witch hunts, like Watergate looking for Mullen Associates, or calling Bernard Fensterwald, who represented uh, James McCord, that broke that case open. Those are witch hunts, I want you to know. And I wrote down that I wanted to ask about Roman Haas. And he had to call, he had to let me call. But when I suggested that there could be biological uh, chemical warfare being tested in this area, he, and I mentioned the contracts of the Defense Department for these things, and the links of Roman Haas to the Defense Department, and to those experiments and their involvement with this company that we were there to talk about. He said, I want to make it certain nobody uh, is to talk about the Defense Department. I couldn't bring that up, even though the papers are flooded with material of this kind of testing. And I handed out handbills, a couple of hundred of them, titled, Is Monterey County Being Used for Tests That Are Being Conducted for Possible Use in Biological Warfare? In the second sentence, is Monterey County being part of an AIDS research project testing the effect of genetically altered engineered bacteria on people who have cancer, a weak immune system, or other sick individuals, and cited their quotation that this bacteria could affect people who might be marginally pathogenic, in poor health, or weak immune systems under certain conditions, the Pseudomonas fluorescence develops infection in cancer patients or other weak individuals. Monterey Herald, January 15, 1986. Well, and also, I had a printout from the higher form of killing that I've shared with you on the intent of Army Biological Warfare to create 
a disease that would defy any cure, that the immunological and therapeutic processes would be broken down, and nobody could intervene, intervene for this type of disease. But be, there was a direct connection between the corporation that was there, and they had this mousy woman, a, a doctor, who spoke a little voice. She just gave her little presentation. This is a very uh, innocent kind of thing that you've blown up. Our intentions are to save life, save agriculture. And you wouldn't know that the Harvard professors and the Princeton professor and the vice president of Roman Haas was on the board of directors of AGS. To see these people, they look like not even mad scientists with any degrees or presentations of any kind. They look like four little mice that crawled out of a cupboard, which is exactly what these dummy front organizations are. They're people that may not even know uh, who the presidents and vice presidents. They may never even heard of Mr. Naylor when I talked about him, but Mr. Sam Karras wouldn't allow me to continue. I'm going to do... I'll share some more of this with you next week, and thanks a lot for getting the articles and information and helping me do some of the research, those of you that did, on Roman Haas and advanced genetic science. I'll be back. This is May Brussel. I'll be back with you next week, and take care, and <laughs> keep well and healthy if you can, and have some fun in the meantime. Bye-bye.